Good evening. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Welcome to the Virtual Cambridge Union. My name is Evie and I'm so excited to be introducing our speaker for this evening. Ada Lamont is a current Guggenheim Fellow and an author of five poetry collections, including The Carrying and Bright Dead Things. She has won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry and was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Kingsley Tufts Book Award. She currently lives in Kentucky and is on the faculty of Queen's University of Charlotte Low Residency MFA program. Ada, over to you. Thank you so much, Evie. It's such a pleasure to be here. Welcome. Um, wish we were in person, but I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to be with you. Uh, I just thought I would start by saying a little bit about why I write, <laughs> what, dr what draws me to the page, um, and then I'll, I'll do a little reading. Um, one of the things that has always struck me about poetry is that there seems to be this idea that when we tell someone to write a poem, the first thing they do is think, okay, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to me? Or what's the saddest thing I've ever experienced? because that's where the poem has to come from. And I, as much as I delight in poems that deal with the real true suffering of the world, the true suffering of the body, the self, grief, I still feel like there's something that we need to pay attention to in terms of turning towards the light, um, a little bit of hope something that tells us that we're surviving and that that survival is as important as our suffering. Um, and so I think that what draws me to the page often is that moment of, okay, the world is going through such a hard time. The world has always gone through hard times. Um, you know, and that sort of bitterness of humanity, the climate crisis, everything that's in the news that's heartbreaking, utterly destroying. But then I also take a moment that focus on the, on the microcosm, the thing that's right around me that I can focus on that says, okay, how do we get through this day? How do we get through this day together? Um, and I think in my mind, or at least what pulls me artistically, is that I feel like it's my duty to myself to remember that my time here is limited all of our time here is limited by the nature of our human existence. Um, and because of that, I would like to lean towards the light, right? Like the plants, like the plants behind me, they, you know, they're leaning towards the light and I would like to lean towards the light like plants. And so I think I find myself um, more and more interested in, in, in finding that seed, that something that can keep me going, that can keep that recognition that this is precious. Um, and I think it's too, it's too often, um, or maybe it's too easy rather, to surrender, to give up, to function on overwhelm and to feel like nothing is worth it. You know, we sit down to the page and we think, what on earth is a poem gonna do with all this suffering, right? And yet even just bringing myself into the present moment um, and recognizing that there is beauty and joy and love um, and praising the natural world, honoring our members of our ancestors, members of our community, uh, shift something inside of me. And I'm not saying that uh, I hope that it, um, or that I think it might do that for somebody else, but I do hope maybe that if a poem of mine lands in their hand, on their screen, most likely, right? <laughs> um, on their phone, over Twitter, over Instagram, whatever it is, the way that we share poems these days, I think if it lands in someone's mind, in someone's heart for that moment, there might be some sort of recognition of kinship and of a sense of ongoingness, like, okay, we can do this. Um, and that's not to say that I don't recognize the limitations of the page, right? 
um, and the limitations of poetry. I don't think poetry is the cure-all. Um, you know, we also need to address major issues in our society, in our world, globally. And I feel like it's, um, it's important to recognize that too. I don't always think of the poetry as being a political act, but I do think of poetry as being a way to recommit to the world. And if that recommitment that I can say, okay, yes, once again, let's be here. Let's do this. Let's be here together. Let's accept our life and maybe even find some delight in there, right? Maybe even a little delight that there might be something that we can lean on. Um, and that might be something that can help us all through so that when we want to make change and feel like we can be strong enough to advocate for the right policies and advocate for the right change in that we want to see in our lifetimes, we can also feel buoyed and a connection with, um, with both the human and the natural spirit that can keep us going. Um, and yeah, so I think that's something that has always kept me returning to the process of writing because it's so easy to just give up. I mean, I too want to lay on the floor and be like, okay, <laughs> I've had enough, but I'm sure for the past, you know, over a year where we've been dealing with COVID and dealing with this crisis and losing so many of our ancestors or elders or loved ones, you know, what is it to, to try to find a bright edge of something? And um, there are days where I can't do that. And I forgive myself that. And then there are days that I can kind of see it somehow. And I remember that part of living is also living for others that can't be here anymore. Um, so yeah, so I have um, five books out now and I just this week finished the draft of my sixth book, um, which I'm very excited about. And I, I won't talk about it too much because I don't know enough about it. It's very fresh and new, but it feels very good to have completed something despite all of the odds feeling stacked against me and feeling very much like many of you who are writers probably feel this, that it felt impossible to make anything, to create anything. Um, you know, I, for a long time, I kept feeling like I was sort of the hummingbird inside the hurricane. Um, it didn't, it just felt pointless to sort of put my pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, if you will. Um, and so I think just having something that was made. Uh, some of the poems are, of course, were written prior to the pandemic, but some of them are written in it. And um, I'm actually was really surprised by that. I was surprised that my process allowed me to get onto the page despite, you know, the fear and anxiety and overwhelming grief that we were processing and, um, and continue to process. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy to report that a new book will be um, on its way, hopefully. Uh, I just sent it to my first readers, so they're, they'll, they'll let me know what I've got, but I've got something. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about my process and, and what has driven me to write poetry. Um, and again, I don't, uh, poetry is really important to me, but I want to also just clarify that I don't think it's the end all be all. It's not going to save us. You know, we are going to save us. Policy is going to save us. Um, and yet I do think it can ground us. It can widen our hearts, open our minds and give us breath. Um, one of the things that I have always loved about poetry is it's one of the only art forms that has breath built right into it because of the line breaks, because of the sejuras, and because of the stanzas, there's white space all around it. And that is breath. And I think, you know, we need breath. We need that inhale. And um, sort of as we come to and come weave, untangle ourselves from, from this particularly hard time, I hope we can find our breath and 
and maybe some poetry too. I really, really love that. And I love as well how poetry almost seems like a, a microcosm of life and how um, kind of your process in terms of poetry and what poetry can do for us is almost reflected in how we approach society and how it's such a difficult and time of pressure at the moment. But your approach to poetry is almost, I don't know, an approach to life in the sense of this idea of breath and the idea of um, seeing the beauty and the difficulty. Um, I, yeah, I really, really like that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really, um, you put it, you put it precisely. Yes, thank you. So um, Ada is now going to be reading um, some poetry from across her um, books, especially, I think you said, Bright Dead Things and The Carrying. Um, mm -hmm. So um, just to let everyone know, if you would like to ask Ada a question, please put it in the form and we will get to those at the end. Um, so Ada. Over to you. Thank you so much, Evie. Um, so I thought I would start with a poem that is the first poem of Bright Dead Things. And um, oddly enough, I just found out that it was going in a capsule to the moon. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I should read the poem that's going to the moon, right? Shall we? Um, so I thought I'd start here. This was uh, originally written um, on the day before the Derby, not this Derby, but a Derby past. Um, I uh, live in Kentucky, and so the Kentucky Derby is a big deal. And um, this was for the Oaks Day, which is the race prior to, um, to the day of the Derby, and it's when all the Phillies race. It's a poem for the ladies. How to Triumph like a girl. I like the lady horses best, how they make it all look easy. Like running 40 miles per hour is as fun as taking a nap or grass. I like their lady horse swagger after winning. Ears up girls, ears up. But mainly, let's be honest, I like that they're ladies. As if this big dangerous animal is also a part of me. That somewhere inside the delicate skin of my body, there pumps an eight pound female horse heart. Giant with power, heavy with blood. Don't you wanna believe it? Don't you wanna lift my shirt and see the huge beating genius machine that thinks, no, it knows it's going to come in first. Um, so that's a poem for the ladies. And then I thought I would read a poem um, that I've thought a lot about this year. And I think about it as an apocalyptic love poem. Um, an interesting one. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, I don't know why, but I, I think I had this moment, you know, when people say everything's going to get better or like, you know, don't worry, it's gonna get better. Mm -hmm. I think as a young person, I was always very suspicious of that. And I thought, well, what if it doesn't? And so I wrote a poem sort of about like, well, what if it doesn't? And so I think of this as my apocalyptic love, apocalyptic love poem. The Conditional. Say tomorrow doesn't come. Say the moon becomes an icy pit. Say the sweet gum tree is petrified. Say the sun's a foul black tire fire. Say the owl's eyes are pinpricks. Say the raccoon's a hot tar stain. Say the shirt's plastic ditch litter. Say the kitchen's a cow's corpse. Say we never get to see it. Bright future, stuck like a bum star, never coming close, never dazzling. Say we never meet her, never him. Say we spend our last moments staring at each other, hands knotted together, clutching the dog, watching the sky burn. Say it doesn't matter. Say that would be enough. Say 
you'd still want this, us, alive, right here, feeling lucky. I really love that. I really love the idea of kind of sitting, sitting with difficulty and kind of sitting with, you know, the issues that you're currently dealing with at that moment and not constantly looking ahead to the future and kind of living in the moment and living with difficulty. I, I think that's definitely a life lesson as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I feel like that poem came out of those moments of like, okay, so if, so if the worst happens, shouldn't we still live, mm. right? Should, and shouldn't we say that we did? Mm. As opposed to, like I said before, that sort of overwhelming surrender that it's so easy to fall into. That idea of like, oh, well, it's all, it's all going, you know, it's all going downhill, so let's just give up. And I think most of my poetry and most of my life, I'm, I'm fighting against that move. I don't want to give up. <laughs> um, this is a poem I wrote uh, for trees. I'm looking out at a silver maple right now that's in our front lawn and um, it's full of birds. And I had this moment where we think oftentimes we write poems for our ancestors and our elders. And then I thought my ancestors are also trees. And so I thought I would write in praise of trees, especially as I know I make books. And so I have to praise the paper that they're written on and printed on. And so here's a poem for trees. Ancestors. I've come here from the rocks, the bone-like chert, obsidian, lava rock. I've come here from the trees, chestnut, bay laurel, toyon, acacia, redwood, cedar, 1,000 oaks that bend with moss and old man's beard. I was born on a green couch on Carragher Road between the vineyards and the horse pasture. I don't remember what I first saw, the brick of light that unhinged me from the beginning. I don't remember my brother's face, my mother, my father. Later, I remember leaves, through car windows, through bedroom windows, through the classroom window, the way they shaded and patterned the ground, all that power from roots. Imagine you must survive without running. I've come from the lacing patterns of leaves. I do not know where else I belong. You have to write a poem for your tree, your tree ancestors, right? There's a poetry prompt for you. Your non-human ancestors, who are they? <laughs> to pass that one on to the, the poetry societies. Yes. Um, this is a poem that I wrote that is particular to, um, I think of the, the time where we feel again, like there's too much going on, too much sort of um, violence in the world. And how do we, how do we push through it? And um, so I was writing this poem, trying to find a little hope, and I realized my hope was in my little dog. So this is uh, for the dog lovers out there. Um, if you've ever tried to pull on a leash to make sure your dog doesn't go into traffic, <laughs> this is a poem about what we do to protect each other. The leash. After the birthing of bombs, of forks and fear, the frantic automatic weapons unleashed, the spray of bullets into a crowd holding hands, that brute sky opening in a slate metal maw that swallows only the unsayable in each of us. What's left? Even the hidden nowhere river is poisoned orange and acidic by a coal mine. How can you not fear humanity? want to lick the creek bottom dry, to suck the deadly water up into your own lungs like venom. 
Reader, I want to say, don't die. Even when silvery fish after fish comes back belly up and the country plummets into a crepitating crater of hatred, isn't there still something singing? The truth is, I don't know. But sometimes I swear I hear it, the wound closing like a rusted over garage door, and I can still move my living limbs into the world without too much pain. Can still marvel at how the dog runs straight toward the pickup trucks, breaknecking down the road because she thinks she loves them because she's sure without a doubt that the loud roaring things will love her back. Her soft small self alive with desire to share her goddamn enthusiasm until I yank the leash back to save her because I want her to survive forever. Don't die, I say. And we decide to walk for a bit longer, starlings high and fevered above us, winter coming to lay her cold corpse down upon this little plot of earth. Perhaps we are always hurtling our bodies toward the thing that will obliterate us, begging for love from the speeding passage of time. And so maybe, like the dog, obedient at my heels, we can walk together peacefully at least until the next truck comes. She's usually up here in my office with me, but she's downstairs with my husband. Um, and relegated for the, for the, the reading. She has, usually she's next to me and you can hear her snoring. She's a pug. So she has a very, very loud snore. Um, if only she knew she was getting poetry written about her. <laughs> I mean, I think that she only um, only loves, uh, the, the only poems she loves are the poems that are written about her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to read this poem now that um, I wrote for my mother, and since it was Mother's Day in the United States on Sunday. Um, I thought it might be uh, worth a read. Uh, also, it's always nice to read a poem that praises someone who did such caretaking. Um, I was born with a, somewhat of a twisted spine. And so my mother and father did a lot of work to, um, to get me walking straight. And this is a poem about that. The raincoat. When the doctor suggested surgery and a brace for all my youngest years, my parents scrambled to take me to massage therapy, deep tissue work, osteopathy, and soon my crooked spine unspooled a bit. I could breathe again and move more in a body unclouded by pain. My mom would tell me to sing songs to her the whole 45 minute drive to Middle Two Rock Road and the 45 minutes back from physical therapy. She'd say that even my voice sounded unfettered by my spine afterward. So I sang and sang because I thought she liked it. I never asked her what she gave up to drive me or how her day was before this chore. Today at her age, I was driving myself home from yet another spine appointment, singing along to some maudlin but solid song on the radio. And I saw a mom take her raincoat off and give it to her young daughter when a storm took over the afternoon. My God, I thought, my whole life, I've been under her raincoat, thinking it's somehow a marvel that I never got wet. I really, really love that one. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Um, I should say also that my mother is a painter and she did the covers, the ones that are available in the UK are, um, she did the paintings that are the oh, covers wow. of these books. Um, she's she, a marvelous painter. Did she paint them from reading the poetry, like being inspired by the poems? Oh, that's amazing. Yes. 
It's um, it's sort of our one collaboration we do, and it's been it's been really a, the highlight of of my life is to to be able to work with her on her creating artwork based on the themes and images and the visual inspiration she gets from the language of the work. Um, it's been a real gift in my life. Will she be doing your your next book? Yes, knock on wood. She said she's already working on it, so we'll see. <laughs> she's got the manuscript, so. <laughs> um, this is a poem um, I'm sure that you, some people, especially in the spring, might relate to. Um, everybody here always is very um, irritated by dandelions. <laughs> and um, I'm always convincing people not to poison them because they're an early flower here um, for our pollinators. And um, if you poison them, you will hurt the bees very much so. So um, I wrote this poem for dandelions and I kept thinking about also the same, the strange idea that we get to decide what's a weed and what's a flower. Um, and so this is sort of praising what I think of as a flower. Dandelion. It's called Dandelion Insomnia. The big ass bees are back, tipsy, sun drunk, and heavy with thick knitted leg warmers of pollen. I was up all night again, so today's yellow hours seem strange and hallucinogenic. The neighborhood is lousy with mowers, crazy dogs, and people mending what winter ruined. What I can't get over is something simple, easy. How could a dandelion seed head seemingly grow overnight? A neighbor mows the lawn and bam, the next morning, there's a hundred dandelion seed heads, straight as arrows and proud as cats, high above any green blade of manicured grass. It must bug some folks. A flower so tricky, it can reproduce asexually, making perfect identical selves. Bam, another me. Bam, another me. I can't help it. I root for that persecuted rosette, so hyper in its own making, it seems to devour the land. Even its name, translated from the French, Dante de Leon, means lion's tooth. It's vicious, made for a time that requires tenacity, a way of remaking the toughest self while everyone else is asleep. Would you say that nature is one of your kind of biggest inspirations, just the trees, the dandelions? Yeah, I think that um, not only the witnessing of nature and the being a part of it, but also recognizing that I too am nature, right? That I think so often in our world, and you probably feel this too, is that we feel separated from it right? That our life is different than a natural life. We have, right, we have the human world and then we have the natural world. And I think my work is very interested in what it is to recognize that we too are nature and that the natural world is also me, even as we live in the Anthropocene and see the damage that humanity has done to nature. So I find it um, not just an inspiration, what a conversation that it feels like I owe it to the natural world to praise and to sing the way that it helps me and saves me and gives us our world. Um, and I think also in, a, in some ways it's a way of um, not feeling lost when we do recognize the damage and impending more damage that is done by the climate crisis. 
and will be done by the climate crisis. And so I feel like it's important to, um, it's just as urgent, I think, to talk about the natural world as it is to talk about other, what we may call political topics. And in talking about climate change, it's kind of this crossover between the two as well. Mm -hmm. How by empowering nature, you can have political change. You said that, um, that poetry you're not, you don't think that it's political, but in a way it almost is in that sense of right. by empowering the natural world, you're also having a positive impact on the political. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, when I say it's not, I mean, it is political, but I also recognize that it's not a political act. Like I, I want it, you have to do more, <laughs> right? Like write your poem, but then also vote. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I think it is. It's a, it's a way of witnessing that feels to me at least deeply important in how, um, in how I live my life. Um, but also in hoping that if I could help someone just recognize that the scrim is thin between the natural world and the human world. Um, because it is one world. <laughs> and I think we, we lose sight of that too often. Um, let's see, this is a poem that um, deals with that a little bit as well. Um, and it started, you know, poems have different ways of coming to us as writers. Um, and this one started with a sound. And um, it was the idea of all of my neighbors rolling out their trash bins and recycling bins for um, you know, they're, they're rubbish bins for, for trash day, for pickup. And you could, you hear, you heard it and it almost sounded like thunder because it was the sound of all the, the wheels coming down the driveway. And so I wrote this poem about, well, it's not about that, but that's where that idea came. Dead stars. Out here, there's a bowing even the trees are doing. Winter's icy hand on the back of all of us, black bark, slick yellow leaves, a kind of stillness that feels so mute it's almost in another year. I am a hearth of spiders these days, a nest of trying. We point out the stars that make Orion as we take out the trash, the rolling containers, a song of suburban thunder. It's almost romantic as we adjust the waxy blue recycling bin until you say, man, we should really learn some new constellations. And it's true. We keep forgetting about Antlia, Centaurus, Draco, Lysirta, Hydra, Lyra, Lynx. But mostly we're forgetting we're dead stars too. My mouth is full of dust and I wish to reclaim the rising to lean in the spotlight of streetlight with you toward what's larger within us, toward how we were born. Look, we are not unspectacular things. We've come this far, survived this much. What would happen if we decided to survive more, to love harder? What if we stood up with our synapses and flesh and said no, no to the rising tides? stood for the many mute mouths of the sea, of the land? What would happen if we used our bodies to bargain for the safety of others, for earth? If we declared a clean night? If we stopped being terrified? If we launched our demands into the sky, made ourselves so big people could point to us with the arrows they make in their minds, rolling their trash bins out? after all of this is over. I thought I would read um, maybe two more from The Carrying and then I'll read um, a couple new poems. And so um, 
this was a poem. It's a love poem for my husband. And um, if you've ever seen a horse being born, you'll know it's foaling season here or at the end of foaling season here. You'll know that um, a horse just comes out of another horse. And um, I was trying to do something with that image of what it was to see something come out so fully formed. And I turned it into a love poem. What I didn't know before was how horses simply give birth to other horses. Not a baby by any means, not a creature of liminal spaces, but already a four-legged beast, hell-bent on walking, scrambling after the mother. A horse gives way to another horse, and then suddenly there are two horses, just like that. That's how I loved you. You off the long train from Red Bank, carrying a coffee as big as your arm, a bag with two computers swinging in it unwieldy at your side. I remember we broke into laughter when we saw each other. What was between us wasn't a fragile thing to be coddled, cooed over. It came out fully formed, ready to run. I love that imagery. Thank you. I always think we, um, you know, people say, oh, that uh, there's not a lot, there's not enough love poems nowadays. And I was thinking, I think it's because love poems are really hard to write. <laughs> They're really terrifying. They're hard to get right. Um, and so um, speaking of, I will uh, read another love poem. And this was from a time when I was on the road a lot, traveling a lot, giving poetry readings. And my husband would see photos of me um, on the social medias and would always be like, oh, you look so great out there. And then I'd come home and turn into the writer self. And my writer self is the disheveled, um, you know, pencils in the hair, not paying attention to how I look, all of those things. And so um, the first line came to me and then the whole poem. Love poem with apologies for my appearance. Sometimes I think you get the worst of me the much-loved loose forest green sweatpants, the long braless days, hair knotted and uncivilized, a shadowed brow where the devilish thoughts do their hoofed dance on the brain. I'd like to say this means I love you. The stained white cotton t-shirt, the tears, pistachio shells, the mess of orange peels on my desk. But it's different than that. I move in this house with you the way I move in my mind, unencumbered by beauty's cage. I do like I do in the tall grass, more animal me than much else. I'm wrong. It is that I love you. But it's more that when you say it back, lights out, a cold wind through curtains. For maybe the first time in my life, I believe it. Um, um, would you say that you, you said earlier that um, you feel when someone approaches a poem there's often a tendency to kind of think about the absolute worst thing in your life and to try and make a poem about that and I, I, don't, I think your approach is more kind of you talk about this need to not be overwhelmed and to find the beauty and it's almost like you find the best thing in your life and you find the thing that gives you most hope and you write about that instead, which is quite a refreshing approach. Yeah, thank you. I'm very interested in what it is to create some equanimity, some space around all that suffering that is bound to happen, that we're going to go through, that is happening, that we are going through. Um, And it's a balance, right? Life is a balance. It's not all hard on the scales. There is joy and I am always curious as to why we feel like the best art focuses on suffering because 
I think the best art makes room for both things. Mm. Yeah. Like life. Yeah. Like life. Um, I guess I'll just read one more. Does that sound good to you, Evie? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Uh, so this is a new poem and this is a poem that speaks directly to the pandemic. So I thought I would close with it. And, um, it was at a time where I was feeling the pointlessness of poetry and I don't very often feel that way, but I'm sure like many of you who make art, there was a time when the pandemic began that we started feeling like there was no way out. We were so worried, so full of anxiety. And I sat down to try to write a poem and I was really um, humbled by how those poetry topics, those ancient topics that we all go to just held nothing for me. Um, and so this is the poem. Of course, what does a poet do when they give up on poetry? They write a poem about it. Um, so thank you again for having me. And um, this is the last poem I'll read. The End of Poetry. Enough of osseous and chickadee and sunflower and snowshoes maple and seeds, samara and shoot. Enough chioscuro, enough of thus and prophecy and the stoic farmer and faith and our father and tis of thee. Enough of bosom and bud and skin and God not forgetting and star bodies and frozen birds. Enough of the will to go on and not go on or how a certain light does a certain thing. Enough of the kneeling and the rising and the looking inward and the looking up Enough of the gun and the drama, the acquaintance's suicide, the long lost letter on the dresser. Enough of the longing and the ego and the obliteration of ego. Enough of the mother and the child and the father and the child. And enough of the pointing to the world, weary and desperate. Enough of the brutal and the border. Enough, can you see me? Can you hear me? Enough, I am human. Enough. I am alone and I am desperate. Enough of the animal saving me. Enough of the high water. Enough sorrow. Enough of the air and its ease. I am asking you to touch me. I, I really, really love that. And actually that was, one of, that was going to be one of my questions, kind of how COVID has changed your perception and your focus. And what I think is so interesting about poetry is that because it's so reflective of life and it's so reflective of the current climate, how poetry has grown as a result of COVID. And I think that it's often um, easy to forget how, how, it, how it's changed poetry because lots of other art forms have kind of been stunted by COVID in terms of like theatres not being able to perform and films. And, but I think poetry has kind of been the opposite experience in the sense of it, it's grown, it's not been stunted. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I... Um when I was an undergraduate college here, I was a theater major and I loved it. And I have always been, um, I have a lot of friends that are in the theater um, and a lot of them are actors in both film and, and stage. And um, one of the things that drew me to poetry was that you could do it by yourself. <laughs> and um, that may feel selfish in some ways, but I do think that there was a relief um, that it didn't always have to be a collaboration, right? Of course it is because you send it to readers um, who will give you edits. And I have a wonderful community that I, that I work with that helped me write my poems. But, um, but just the idea that it didn't, the art itself didn't require um, that initial sense of rel reliance on other people um, was a big, a big thing for me and I it became very doubly I should say it became doubly clear during during the pandemic um of how lucky I was to have this art form as my art my chosen art form yeah. so we've had lots of questions um rolling in on the form so I just think I'll just start going through those and hearing your views um so we've kind of already touched on this but in kind of a more general sense, when you um, you talked about a range of approaches and inspirations for poems, but what do you think is the hardest part about actually wrote, actually writing the poetry? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing to for me that like actually getting poetry down on the page begins with the fact that I've always believed that writer's block doesn't come from not having anything to say, but because you have too much to say. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest thing for me as I begin poetry and the writing process is to get small, is to focus on that one thing, whether it's the dandelions, you know, whether it's the cat, whether it's the dog with the leash and the starlings above, you know, what, like to try to get focused, small and and contained so that whatever comes after that, that can open up. But I think it's really hard for me in the beginning to not just be overwhelmed by the many different topics or the many different things that are running through me as we all are so inundated by so many things on a minute by minute basis based on how we absorb information from others and from social media. So I think it's about turning that off a little bit and trying to find quiet so that I can um, really focus in and start small. Um, Kind of going back to the origins, you talked about um, the the idea of of being able to do it yourself um, as being one of the major reasons that you went into poetry. Was there other any inspirations that made you decide to go into poetry after theatre or anything? Yeah, I think um, right after, so I I adored uh, my undergraduate degree and the drama department where I went at the University of Washington in Seattle is a marvelous department. And, um, but I did feel as soon as I started taking my first poetry course um, that there was some kind of dislodging that happened in my body when I was given the permission to write my own words. And it suddenly felt like I didn't know I needed that. I didn't know it was something that I was missing. Um, I thought I could be an instrument and and let other people's words move through me. Um, But in reality, I think what really was a gift for me was actually figuring out that I needed so much to have access to my own voice and to figure that, figure out what that voice was. Um, so that was that moment was when I was like, oh, wait, this is something that comes from, from within. And, um, it, it felt something like freedom. I love that. I love the empowerment of it. Mm. Would you say, you said that writer's block, you don't think it's due to a lack of ideas, but rather too many. Would you say that that's just specific to you? Or would you say that anyone can write poetry? Does everyone have that inspiration and that um, thing within themselves to do so? You know, I think that everyone can access it. Um, I do think it takes work and focus and concentration to want to access it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think it's easy to maybe tell a story to say, okay, a poem has a beginning, middle of an end. And really um, there's a great quote from C.D. Wright where She says, um, the goal is not to make a story, but experience the whole mess. And I think poetry is much more interested in the mess, in in the complication, in the capacity to hold all things, right? Both the suffering and the joy, et cetera. And not just make something into, oh, here's the moral of the story, right? which is the part we never quite believe. That's the part where we're like, And so I think it's really about accessing, you know, and I think anyone can do that. I do think that, but it just takes that work. And also the desire to really want to know what's arising for you on a personal level, what's driving you to the page. Because it can't just be about making something. It also has to be about an urgency within you that's working through something. Do you think, I think it's interesting how um, lots of poets kind of own their sexuality and own their gender through their poetry. And I think um, probably one of the most famous is um, Maya Angelou. Um, Would you say that, do you think that being a woman has an impact on how you write your poetry and your inspirations? Your first poem was kind of the pride of being a woman and having this kind of this force within you and do you think that that really plays out in your other poetry and how you approach it 
Yeah, I think of my poetry as distinctly feminist. I think that being in a gendered body in our society, um, it's hard not to have that be an image and uh, a, a theme that runs through the work because if I'm paying attention to what my life is, right? And how I move through the world. I move through the world in a gendered body that sees my gender and has requirements of me. Um, in the carrying, I talk specifically about um, infertility and not being a mother. And I have found great freedom in not being a mom, but I know that there is so much pressure on many women um, that that is their number one role as a female gendered person in, in the world. And I, I, that, that to me feels very limiting. Um, and so I do, yeah, I think it's, I think it is, it runs through a lot of my work. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking about the new book. I'm like, is it, it? And I think it's in that too. I mean, I, I, I think it's impossible. It's kind of like, it's impossible to escape the body, right? Like, you know, I know that I am more than my body. I know I'm beyond my body, but also my physical reality is part of uh, what's driving me to the page. So, yeah, it's going to be there. Mm. I think that's really interesting. And I think also it's almost like a parallel with how the, the, our physical nature kind of um, separates us from our the, 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 the body is almost like another barrier, as, it, as you kind of described this barrier between how we view ourselves and nature as well. I think that's interesting, that parallel. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very true because I like, I like the idea of sort of being the original self, mm -hmm. but where gender doesn't exist and where, you know, it's much more of the animal self, but, um, but it's, you know, like, like many things, we live in a patriarchal society. And so it's, it, it, it comes back, <laughs> it comes back and it's going to be in the work. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. That's inevitable. The mm -hmm. poem is so reflect, poem, poetry is so reflective that it's going to reflect that aspect of society. Yeah. Mm. Um, we have a question about so obviously you work at um, Queen's University of Charlotte, you teach people about poetry. What advice would you give to the young and inspiring poets that are watching now? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, I would say, first of all, don't give up, keep writing. Um, I think that even if you write just for yourself and you also become an engineer or some brilliant scientist, you can always write poems there. I have two friends that are doctors and poets, um, like William Carlos Williams, of course, you know, the famous example of that. Um, so it doesn't always have to necessarily be your career. So don't freak out if you need to like do multiple things, that's totally fine. Um, and then I would also say that um, to, not get too caught up on what is popular or what is um, sort of the rage these days. I, I think that it's important to remember your own voice, what it is that brings you to the work, what it is that brings you to the page. Remember what it is that makes you different, you know, your weirdness, your idiosyncrasies, your um, the thing that makes you you, the voice underneath the voice. That's where the poetry is. Um, so don't, you know, don't try to conform. In fact, working against that conformity is going to be where making the art, uh, feels authentic to you. And, um, and also feels like, you know, a freedom. So, yeah, I would say, I would say that don't get too caught up in what's getting praise and focus on really what it is that makes you feel good and you feel free on the page. Mm -hmm. Who, do you think that there's a specific poet that you have learned the most from or who is your favourite poet or along the same lines, the one that you read and thought, I've got to do this, I, I have to empower myself? Yeah, well, great questions. Um, it's always so hard because there were so many, right? I think that I, I don't know about you and your experience with um, reading. I know you're a deep reader, but where it's like, it's just like branches, like that feels like 
they're all like it's the, the tree and then it's like all these branches and they're all kind of at once um but i can name a few um elizabeth bishop was an early poet for me that i just really admired um audrey lord lucille clifton um emily dickinson you can see there's a nod to her in that the last poem I read when I said a certain light does a certain thing. Um, who else? Uh, I think that uh, I was also, you know, my teachers at NYU were such influences on me. I read everything that they had ever written. That's why I went there. Um, was Phil Levine, Sharon Olds, and Murray Howe, um, as well as the great poet who's no longer with us, Agasha Hedali, um, who was, you know, really responsible for bringing the Hazel and, the, and that form into um, at least the, the U.S. culture more predominantly. But um, so those, those are a few names, but there's so many, um, you know, I, it's always, I feel blushed to, um, to name them because it feels like I'm already leaving somebody out. But, uh, but those are a few. Do you still feel like you're learning the more when you read other people's poetry now and do you feel like there's still parts of it that you read now and inspired by or you feel like you learn something about the discipline as a result all the time I feel like all I do is learn um I don't feel like I'm the master of anything um in fact when I teach I'm always saying you know I I, I don't have I I maybe have done this for a little bit longer than you have but I certainly don't have the answers Mm -hmm. um, but poetry is teaching me all the time. Sometimes a poem that I maybe even have dismissed or discounted, I'll read it again and think, oh, this is marvelous. Why did I not love this immediately? As I, yeah, I don't know if that's happened to you where it's like, it hits you at the right time, yeah. you know? And then you think, oh no, this is, I needed this poem. Um, so yeah, I am, I am much more comfortable and at home in the learning mode than I am pretending to know anything <laughs> no I really really love that and I think it's definitely true when I read a poem for a second or even a third time I find all these hidden meanings that I, I didn't even realize were there or that I just hadn't been in the right mindset the first time to read and so yeah. poetry is such a kind of a layered thing and obviously a poet I mean you you'll know this firsthand but a poet puts so much thought into a into the, every single word that is used and the way it sounds and just every aspect of a poem and so the more times you go back to it the more you learn from it I don't think that ever really stops yeah yeah totally completely agree um I think we'll do one more question yeah um so this is I think this question I think has been submitted by someone who is um, an aspiring poet and they ask how did you decide when your poems were ready enough or um, good enough to be read by others mm. yeah I mean I think that um, first of all I'm glad that you're a poet keep going um, but I think for me a lot of it had to do with reading out loud to myself I almost compose a lot out loud I'll write one line, read it out loud, write the second line, read that part out loud, or maybe a whole stanza, read that whole thing out loud. And I think that for me, once I hear it, so it's both in the mouth, in the ear, in the eye, the brain, the, you know, it's, it's a body experience. And when I start to feel satisfied by how those sounds are working and that they're moving together with both the meaning and the images, and it feels like there's a richness and a depth to the work, that's when I feel like, oh, okay, it, it's ready for to, to send to one of my first readers. Um, and if you're lucky, you can have that, you know, those first readers who can be very generous and kind to you and caretake with you. And then also make some, you know, beautifully um, insightful uh, and necessary edits when necessary. And how, so do, who are the people that read your poems? How do you are they other poets or just readers? How do you decide um, who is going to be able to give you a kind of, um, I don't know, a kind of a deeper reflection on a poem that you can kind of learn and improve from? Yeah. Um, my, my very first reader since I was probably 15 is actually my stepfather. Uh, he's a wonderful, he was a fiction writer for a while and is just um, a marvel, just a, a good reader. You know, those people who just 
are deep readers and he's that person. And um, so I'm very lucky to have someone in my own family that can offer me that advice and, and also do the caretaking of my heart so that I'm not obliterated by his, by his edits or, you know, he's very kind in, in, in giving feedback, but will let me know if something is not working. Um, and then my other readers are a group of um, a few poets, two poets that I studied with um, at NYU. So that we graduated together in the same cohort um, at graduate school. And so they were great readers then, and we've stayed close. And so those two are my other readers. And then I have a, a few other readers that are poets, um, who I trust. And, you know, we've developed a good friendship that I trust. So it's about, I would say probably like five people total that will do sort of the initial reading to help me kind of get it to the next level. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's um, been a real privilege to hear your work firsthand. And thank you so much for taking the time to answer um, people's questions and for joining us. Um, I'm just gonna say a few events that are happening at the Union over the next few days, just um, for people that would like to attend those. So we have former cricketer Darren Gow speaking tomorrow at 10 a.m. We have Michael Hesseltine speaking tomorrow at half three and we have um, Mike Tommaso and Paul Bloom speaking on Thursday at 6pm. Um, once again, thank you so much, Ada. It's been amazing to hear you. Thank you so much. It's been my deep honour to be here. <laughs>